It's good to be here this morning, and we are all here because of the magnificent mercy of God. And that's what I want to talk about for just a few moments this morning, and uh, we're glad that you're here to worship with us, and we pray that everyone's worship today will be in spirit and truth and glorify the God that has extended His mercy to us and has provided us a way to live with Him through a never-ending eternity. And uh, Jeremy, it is interesting that you mentioned these posters, because when I was deciding which side to put the posters on, I, I was looking out over the audience and I saw Shauna here. And I was thinking about who Shauna's husband was, and so I put ultimate good on this side. You know, has to be. Um, we'll get to these uh, in just a moment. I'm going to ask for some volunteers here in just a little bit. Um, and uh, my prayer is in this lesson that our faith will be fortified, our lives will be more joyous, and that we will be more motivated to live for our Savior because of the great mercy that He's extended to us. We're here today because of that mercy, and I wonder how many people today who are worshiping in spirit and in truth really are letting God's mercy affect their daily lives. Not just today, not just on Sunday, but Sunday through Sunday. When we think of God's mercy, mercy again is one of those umbrella words. You know, a lot of times we study umbrella words. There are so many words and ideas that come under the umbrella words. When we talk about grace... When we talk about mercy, what could fall under the general category of mercy? Man, every, uh, forgiveness, salvation, the fact that we're here breathing, the fact, uh, anything, uh, almost from, a, from an ultimate good standpoint, comes under God's mercy. And the Bible has much to say about mercy, but I want you to think about it a continuum with me. I want you to think about your lives. And on this continuum, we have on this side lives that um, particularly don't think about God's mercy much and their daily choices, especially the major decisions in life, are not necessarily guided by God's mercy. And then on the other side of this continuum, we have Christians that are dedicated to making God's mercy a part of every major decision, every, every major part of their lives. Where would you fall on that continuum? This is an important question. I think we're going to see the importance of the question as we go on. Let me ask another question, and please raise your hands. If, if, uh, if this is in the affirmative, how many of us truly believe in the mercy of God? Would you raise your hand if you believe in the mercy of God? I, I see some hands just now kind of coming up. It's, it's like peer pressure. You, you, know, you don't want to look like Satan. Everyone else is raising their hand, so I'll go ahead and raise my hand. I'm going to go on with the assumption that you believe wholeheartedly in the mercy of God. If you didn't believe in the mercy of God, let me ask this question. Say you didn't believe in the mercy of God. How would your life be different than it is now? Now, if you have to think too hard and long about that to come up with something, you're going to have to ask yourself, do you really believe in God's mercy as a significant thing? For example, if we really believe in the mercy of God, how does that transform the way we partake of the Lord's Supper? Think about that holy communion. There should be such a profound appreciation for going on there. It would be such a holy reverence 
and appreciation for the mercy of God that there would be no getting up and leaving and there would be no checking out Facebook and there would be no passing notes and talking and, and uh, noticing the surroundings around us. You know, that, that would be the case even if we're, if we're worshiping in spirit and in truth. But a genuine reflection and appreciation for God's mercy, that changes lives. That changes our worship. It takes worship from being a mundane kind of ritualistic exercise to a spiritually significant encounter with God. God's mercy. It's kind of like what Paul said as he wrote to the Corinthians, how important it was during that time to discern the Lord's body or we eat and drink damnation to our souls. That's worshiping in spirit and truth as it pertains to the Lord's Supper. It's the same idea. But what helps us do that? It's having a significant appreciation for God's mercy. All my sins and the garbage in my life, as I am turning from that, God is taking that away, all made possible by the mercy of the cross, and that brings joy and excitement. And if I can think that way during the week, what will that do with my, to my worship on the Lord's Day? I can't wait to get there. We won't be having questions, well, do I have to come on Sunday night? You know, we won't be asking things like that. That's just a symptom. The heart of the problem is appreciating God's mercy. Saul of Tarsus is a good example of all that. You remember Saul? He was a Pharisee. He was a higher up in Judaism. He was a leader of the Jews. He had a, comf a confident, comfortable kind of religion, kind of guy. He was very um, satisfied with the fact that he was killing Christians. And then he had an encounter with Jesus. And he, he understood then the mercy of God, and that changed his life. That changed it completely. He went from uh, Saul, the persecutor, to Paul, the persecuted, and probably the most persecuted Christian that ever lived on the face of the earth. Even persecuted more than Jesus Christ himself, as far as times go. And this mindset, this appreciation for the mercy of God, caused him to write this in 1 Timothy chapter 1, beginning at verse 13. Although, listen to this, although I was formerly a blasphemer. We don't use that word too often today, but the word blaspheme simply means to speak against. Saul spoke against Christ, not only with his actions, with his thoughts, with his life. He was, he was one of the first antichrists, if you will. And he says, I was formerly like that. He said, I was a persecutor. Here's another word we don't use too often. Too often. And an insolent man. Do you know what the word insolent means? It means he was at the height of disrespect. Even though he lived before God with all good conscience, he was disrespectful to Christians and to Christ. He said, I was an insolent man, but he said, I obtained mercy. And how profoundly appreciative he was of that. How do we know? Look at his life. Look at his life. I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. And the grace, he says, and it seems like he's using mercy and grace interchangeably in this passage. And the grace or mercy of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love in Christ Jesus. He says this is a faithful and worthy of all acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, he says, for this reason, and he says it again, I obtained 
mercy. This marvelous mercy from above. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. Notice this, this is so neat. As a pattern or example to all of those who will believe. Paul is saying, God is going to use me as a type of first fruit, as a type of example, to show how merciful this God is because he can forgive even me. Do you think this idea caused Paul to be who he was in life? Do you think this did anything for his worship? Do you think this did anything for his evangelistic outlook? And I want you to look in 1 Timothy 1 and notice some, a couple of verses before he said that in verses 13 through 16. Look up in verse 9. So significant. He says, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, Notice this list, for, fornication, uh, for fornicators, for homosexuals, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. Notice that not only does he mention his sins, but he mentions another category of sins. And in the, both of these lists, every one of us here this morning can plug in a certain time in our lives where we were guilty of these same things. Every one of us. What would life be without the magnificent mercy of God? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the great resurrection chapter, notice something here that is, is correlated to what we have just examined. Look beginning in verse 36 of 1 Corinthians 15. He's talking about the glorious body with which we're going to be raised. And he's comparing the physical body with the spiritual body. And in 1 Corinthians 15 beginning at verse 36, he says, as he often does, O oh, foolish one. Uh, are, are you foolish? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. You know, this is the example of uh, being born again. In order to be a Christian, you've got to die first because what comes up in its place is much more glorious than what was killed. And he uses the example of a seed. You know, a seed must die first before it's planted and it grows into something more glorious than what was planted. That's his point in verse 37. And what you sow, you do not sow that body that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. God gives it a body as he pleases, and to each seed his own body. And then down in verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. The physical body is sown in corruption. You ever wonder why after a, a body dies, immediately thereafter, there's a sheet that's put over the body? Because there's some really uh, corruptible things that take place at that point. That body goes to death in corruption, in dishonor. But it is going to be raised in honor. It's going to be resurrected. The seed, that which dies, the person that is buried with Christ in baptism must die and must be raised to live again, to live a new life. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. Tough episodes in life happen, but it is fine at the end. Right now, we are like that seed being sown. We're to take the seed and sow it, but we are like seed. We are living now in corruption. We are in a corruptible body. 
But you know, when we go through episodes in life, sometimes we allow those episodes to so engulf us that those episodes are going to decide where we spend eternity. Spirituality, Christianity, is talking against that, and it's all because of the mercy of God. I thought about the best way that I could illustrate this. I remember when I was a little boy in the 60s, my very favorite show, television show, you know what it was? Batman. <laughs> Nothing like the Batman of today. Adam West and Burt Ward. Batman. My first hero just passed away a little while ago. Adam West just passed away. But I remember, and, and there's something, you know, and Batman back then was on prime time. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock at night on ABC. I, I, I know that. I remember that. And I remember every episode, you know, most of those uh, shows, they happened in two parts. The first part, Batman was always captured. Always. And whether it was the Penguin or the Joker or, or the Riddler or whoever, they would always capture Batman and Robin, usually both of them, and they were in some kind of, uh, of, uh, of a situation where they were on a conveyor belt and they were going down to the saw and it was going to saw them in two. Or they were getting ready to be thrown into this heated slime or something. All the time. And then the question came at the end. Now remember, I was like five years old, four or five years old at this time. And so, you know, I was really worried for Batman. You know, I said, Batman, don't go in there. The Riddler's in there. He's going to get you and he's going to put you on this thing. And then at the end of that episode, the announcer would always come on and ask a question if Batman's going to make it, turn in next time to the same bat time, same bat channel. Well, you know, Batman didn't come on every night of the week. So for a little kid, that was eternity to see if Batman was going to make it. But I was smarter than most little kids. You know what I did? I got to the TV guide. And I saw where in two or three nights, Batman was going to play again. And it showed, you know, what that show was going to be about. Batman was still going to be alive. So I said, he must be going to get out of this situation because he's got to come on Thursday night again, you know, to fight crime. <laughs> That's the way our lives are when you think about that. We have here different episodes of our lives. And we're going down, we're on the conveyor belt, going down to that saw, getting ready to split in half or so, we think. But then I get the, uh, the not the TV guide, I get the life guide. And I look in here and I read about Paul being that first example of suffering. And, and I read about these things and I see the next episode, the episode that really counts. I don't stay in the third season. I see where God is going to have fourth, fifth, sixth, eightieth seasons and it's all going to turn out really good. What's the heated slime or the chainsaw in your life that you're worried about right now? There's another series to come. And this is a good lesson to have on the heels of our Providence series. Because you know what? You don't have to worry about tomorrow. God is already there. He's already there. So it's up to us. What are we going to believe in? The mercy of God should change the way you view everything on this earth. Step back from the tough episodes. It's going to be fine. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, since we have this ministry. Have you ever looked at the context in 2 Corinthians 4 and what he means by this ministry? I don't believe he's referring to his overall ministry there of preaching the gospel. If you look in the immediate context, he's talking about all of his suffering. And he's talking about, yeah, we're cast down, but we're not defeated, you know, all of that. And that's, he said, that's his ministry. 
I'm glad that because of the mercy of God, he was able to look down the stream of time and, hey, I can handle this. I can handle this with God. It's going to be fine. We look at the body. We look at the corruptible nature of this earth. We worry about dying. Why? Why do you worry about it? You know why? Because you're walking by sight. Paul asked in 1 Corinthians 15, Oh, death, where is your what? It's like taking a yellow jacket. It's like taking a bee. You know, if you took the stinger out of the bee, you'd have a pretty neat pet there, all furry and yellow, and you could pet that bee. You could take the sting out of him. How about death? When God tells you what? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear getting stung. Oh, death. He mocks death. Paul could mock death. You know why? Because he was such an adamant believer in the mercy of God. Oh, death, where is your sting? Death, is this what you can bring? Is this, is this it? Where, where's the victory? No. We are more than conquerors. Have you conquered death in your mind yet? Is it something to be dreaded, or are you looking forward to it, ladies and gentlemen? If you're an adamant believer in the mercy of God, there's no sting there. There's no problem there. It's better. No matter what the episodes are in your life. There is one phrase that's peculiar to Jesus throughout the Bible. Nobody else says it but him. You know what it is? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. You know, we could sit here and we could debate whether or not there's a God and all the religions of the world, we can do all that. But a lot of times Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't, he doesn't go argue that. Doesn't have time for that. And sometimes he just lays it out. And the Apostle Paul does that too. And he does that too in 1 Corinthians 15 as the chapter opens up. And he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which you have also received, and in which you stand, and by which you are also saved. And he talks about how Christ was delivered to death. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. And on the third day, he, uh, or he was buried on the third day, he arose again according to the scriptures. He says here, you have sinned and you should be punished. Okay? You have sinned. You are a sinner. You really, I know we give that lip service. Nobody's perfect. You know, I know that. But do you really believe that? That you are a sinner? That's what Paul says. You ask people, do you think you're going to heaven? You know what the answer is usually? Well, there's some hesitancy. Well, I think so. I think so. Hello? We're talking about an eternity in heaven or an eternity in hell, and you just think so? I think we need to uh, consider that just a little bit. This is too grand and too great to have an I think so attached to the question, are you going to heaven? I want to illustrate this a moment. Would my five volunteers please come up and help me with this illustration? Now we're talking about our props here. Ultimate evil and ultimate good. All right. When you think of somebody in this life that is ultimately good. What comes to mind? Who comes to mind? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> At least he's willing to admit it. <laughs> Who would we think of? Uh, Mother Teresa, right? We're talking about, uh, about a scale of good works. All right. Let's say Mother Teresa. Who will be Mother Teresa for us? Here, you all come here to the middle. Everybody come to the middle. Since, uh, since uh, some up here come from good stock, we'll let Caroline be Mother Teresa. So when, come on over here, Caroline. Stay under here. Here we're talking about good works. Mother Teresa. When we think about the ultimate evil, 
Who might we think about? <laughs> Hitler? Genghis Khan? Stalin, maybe? All right, um, okay, Michael. <laughs> he wanted, he wanted to, he's, he was over here. All right. You don't have the mustache to be Hitler. It's not the little... That's uh, good. That's, all right, that's good. All right, here's Hitler. Now... Think about other people who have lived. Anybody, name one. Somebody. All right, which one? Franklin Roosevelt. All right. Owen is going to represent Franklin Roosevelt. Now, tell me on this continuum of ultimate good with Mother Teresa and ultimate evil with Adolf Hitler, where would Franklin Roosevelt go? Here's, here's the middle. Where, where, where do we put Franklin? This way? Or this way? Where do we put him? Okay, right there? Go any further? Okay. We'll put Franklin Roosevelt right here. All right, who else? Donald Trump. That's an interesting one. All right. Donald Trump, President Trump. Okay, I, I, I'm going to move... President Trump, you tell me which way President Trump should go. We're going to see how conservative this congregation really is. Do we go this way? Do we go this way? Okay. All right. Boy, I tell you, we're divided right down the middle. Let's leave President Trump right here for the time being. All right, give me one more. Anybody? Michael Jordan. There you go. Michael Jordan. Nah, you can't, you can't cheat. Oh. This is a democracy. Everybody gets a voice. Okay, where do we put Michael Jordan? I thought you were going to say Michael Jackson. Oh. If he started to moonwalk, I would... Uh, oh. All right. Michael Jordan. Where does Michael Jordan go on the continuum? This way? Or so he's perceived? Okay. Does Michael Jordan go further than uh, Franklin Roosevelt? Not quite? Okay, like maybe right in here. Okay, well, my point exactly. We don't all agree on where this goes. And the Bible doesn't say that, uh, you know, so many good works and th th then you're going to be saved. That's not where this happens. But then... We have another sign here. Let me ask you a question. If we were to call you up on stage as far as your life goes, where would you go on the continuum? Be honest. Where would you go? But then we take this. We take this sign according to what the Bible teaches. Now let me ask you a question. Where does this sign go? Do you know? As good as Mother Teresa is. And this is the lie that Satan has perpetuated in the minds of people. And I hear it at funerals all the time. You know, this person would give you the shirt off their back, therefore they're saved. You know, I think if we would all think about Jean Franklin, and say Jean Franklin were alive today and she was one of my volunteers, where would we put Jean? Well, we all agreed on that one. Sorry, President Trump. We all agreed where we put Gene, wouldn't we? Where does this Bible say that this sign goes? Interestingly enough, it goes right here. All have sinned and deserve to go to hell. Interesting that this sign is placed right in front of the place where we contact the blood. Because our good works, no matter how many they are, from Mother Teresa to Adolf Hitler, to Gene Franklin to Genghis Khan, that's not the deciding factor, folks. It's because of God's mercy that he saves us. Because none of us can be good enough, can ever do enough, can never earn our salvation. It's all because of his mercy. Is that not a life changer for you? Is there any significance in that at all in your lives? If, if, if it is, oh, that's a life changer. Thank you, volunteers.
very much. As we close, I want to I leave you with Mark chapter 16. And I want you to look at verse number 7. This is, this is amazing to me in my mind. Do you remember when Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, went out to the grave of Jesus? And they were told, he's not here, but go tell the disciples and who? Why Peter? Wasn't Peter one of the disciples? Why is it the disciples and Peter? Because you know how Peter must have felt now after denying the Lord? He felt like, he felt bad, very bad, because he denied his Lord. He's the one that said, Lord, I'll die with you. The Lord said, Peter, you're not going to die with me. In fact, you're going to do just the opposite. You're going to deny you even knew me. And I'm going to die for the sins of the world, but I'm going to die for you too. And now after he resurrected, he said, go get the disciples, and especially Peter. Does that mean anything to you? Have there been times in your life when you just left the Lord, where you took off the wedding ring, when you vowed at your baptism to be married to Jesus Christ, you threw the ring away, you divorced him, you walked out on him? Is there times in your life when you know you should be speaking a word for the master because of his great mercy for you, and you just don't do it? I wonder if Jesus is saying now, go call the disciples and call, and then we put our names in there. Ladies and gentlemen, that's mercy. When we continually, because of our ignorance, because of our weakness, sin against him, he says, listen, you can obey the gospel, you can contact my blood through that obedience, and I'm going to continue to want to be married to you. The only way that marriage is going to be broken is if you decide to leave and you continue to live a life of sin without any regard, without any trying, without any, and not realizing this great mercy that's going to keep us married. And that's why Paul would write to Titus in chapter 3 and verse 5, and he says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Even if we beat Mother Teresa twice over, it's not by works of righteousness. It's not if we give people the shirt off our backs. Where did that ever come from? That's something that a Christian does, but that's not the foundation of our salvation. But according to his mercy, he saved us. Through what? The washing of regeneration and by the Holy Spirit. Do we need to argue all that? You know, this should be the motivation for stopping sins in our lives, no matter what it is. Whether it's substance abuse, whether it's pornography, whether it's, where does it all lie? It all begins with an appreciation for the mercy of God. That even though I've made shambles of my life. How many of us are like that today? We all started out thinking we were going to do the right thing. But life, the episodes in our life was like Batman. It didn't go out according, it didn't go as according to plan. Did it? Is the mercy of God still available? You better know that it is. And it's available right now. And it's going to be available as long as we have life. But in a, in a specific real way, it's going to be available in this invitation song. So if there's someone here, one person, whose life isn't necessarily going the way that you had planned, if that plan especially was according to God's plan, and it kind of took a, a detour, by his mercy, he still wants you. He wants you to come back to your husband. He wants to save you. And he will do it, but it's going to take your willing heart and your humble attitude to do it. If we can help anybody here today to
to realize and appreciate the mercy of God Almighty. Why don't you let us know that by coming forward while together we stand and sing.